Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to the second seminar in the Rylands Lunchtime Seminar Series. My name is Gaida Armstrong from the John Rylands Research Institute and Library um, and at the University of Manchester and I'll be chairing the session today. So in this series we're experimenting with a new online presentation format which allows participants to view collection objects live and to participate in discussions. Today we're running this remotely from a number of uh, locations across the University of Manchester and beyond. Uh, so thank you for joining us as we trial this format. Our seminar today is on imaging and imagining early modern feather fans, and it'll be presented by Stefan Hans from the History Department and Tony Richards from the Rylands Imaging Team. So before I introduce our speakers, um, there are just a few things for me to mention. First of all, this, this event is being recorded uh, and it will be made available on the John Rylands Library YouTube channel. Uh, you can get auto subtitles using your own settings. We're using a Zoom webinar format, so this means that your camera and mic is disabled on entry. At the end of the session, there'll be some time for questions. So if you'd like to ask a question, could you add them uh, to the Q&A function? Um, these will be selected by me as the chair and then relayed to the speakers. Um, we should have time to take a couple of questions. Um, we're hoping to finish by 12.45 or so. Um, so that should give us uh, time to explore the things that are interesting you. Um, you can also use the chat function as well for additional comments. And we'll be monitoring both channels as we go through the seminar. And finally, as I said at the start, this is quite a new format for us. So we're we'll really interested in knowing what you think about it. We'll be sending out a feedback survey uh, to you all after the event. OK, after all that, I'm going to introduce you to our two speakers. So first of all, we have Dr. Stefan Hans, who's senior lecturer in early modern history at the University of Manchester and the winner of British Academy Rising Star Engagement Award in 2019, as well as a Philip Leverhulme Prize in history in 2020. So Stefan is an absolute Renaissance polymath. Um, it would take me all day to outline his achievements to you. Um, so I'm just going to highlight a few here. Um, he works on cultural encounters and global material culture. And he's already published two monographs and two edited volumes on European Ottoman encounters in the early modern Mediterranean. He's currently writing a monograph on the early modern history of hair and um, has published his first findings in two journal articles in the journals Gender and History and History Workshop Journal. At the same time, he's, con uh, he's continuing his research on early modern feathers, and that's what he'll be talking to you about today. Um, presenting with Stefan today, we have Tony Richards, another Renaissance man, um, in this case of visual technologies. Uh, Tony's one of our senior photographers at the Rylands. He's recently taken the lead on our advanced imaging techniques, such as multispectral imaging, reflectance transformation imaging, photogrammetry and 3D scanning within the John Rylands. And beyond that, he's also an expert in historic photographic techniques. So thank you both for talking to us today and over to you. Thank you very, very much, Gaida, and a warm thanks to the entire team of the John Rowlands Research Institute and Library. It is really a joy to present some of our research findings here today. Um, may we introduce the main protagonist of our paper, the Messel Standing Feather Fan. It is a feather fan which is in the collections of the Fitzwilliam Museum Cambridge. It's named after its former owner, Leonard Messel. And not much is known about this fan thus far, except that art historical analysis um, suggests it originates from the Low Countries from around 1660s. Um, for you to get a better idea of this amazing artifact, it measures 34 by 23 centimeters, and it is a very, very special artifact, I would say. Its color vibrancy is, dedu is seductive, its intricacy attracts the eye, its presence elicits curiosity, so its capacity to engage the senses really makes the fan what I would call an effective artifact. And our today's paper is very much about exploring the 17th century connections between materiality, affectivity and cognition embodied in such a feather fan. And we propose a new interdisciplinary methodology to study such a fan, a methodology that combines in-depth archival research with imaging technologies and that allows us to um, gain really new insights into the material choices, the artisanal processes that went into the making and the crafting 
of such offense effectivity. So out of a sudden, we start to think about craft interventions as instantiating, as engendering effectivity. There are a number of goals associated with this paper. So we really wish to push the analysis of this artifact um, to go beyond an analysis that is predominantly grounded in an analysis of symbolism, of iconography. Um, it's not so much for us, it's not so much about the actual product, but more about the making of such an artifact and how making was um, an artisan's means to unfold the Fane's universe of sensorial and effective possibilities. And we also want to reach beyond an essentialism and an essentialization of feather work that is often associated exclusively with indigenous cultures. Um, we rather explore this mesophen as emerging from a world of a world in flux due to colonialism, due to consumerism, and its effectivity, we argue, is very much anchored in an early modern artisan's creative response to the Dutch discovery of indigenous Amazonian biodiversity and biocreativity. So it's about practicing matter in an increasingly globalized world. Um, this feather fan for us functioned as a site of innovative cultural crossings of material experiments. And it's very much about, we argue, the presence of um, never seen Amazonian things that engendered novel forms of material creativity, innovative material thinking, innovative material imagination in this time that crossed the colonial divide. And above all, as I said already, we wish to establish or develop a new method in approaching the study of such artifacts. And none of this would have been possible without the Rylands and an amazing team of enthusiastic, very creative, very dedicated and committed um, researchers. It is very much a collaborative project that was uh, generously supported by the British Academy. And um, I very much owe special thanks to the imaging lab of the John Rylands, um, especially Gwen, Tony, James, as well as the curators and conservators of the Fitzwilliam Museum. Um, and we are now going to say and hear a bit more about this method and how um, we approached this um, fan by Tony. Thank you, Stefan. Hello, everyone. Um, I think a good place to start is to acknowledge that um, the John Rylands has always recognized the need to photograph its collections in such a way. And this, uh, this slide shows an extract from the Minutes book um, on the establishment of the photographic studios here at the Rylands. And towards the bottom of this quote, you can read, the value of the treasures of the library is greatly enhanced for purposes of research, since they are made more readily available to scholars at a distance. And there could be little doubt that this new department is fraught with possibilities of worldwide benefit. Now this is over a hundred years ago at the Rylands, but this statement has not really changed, but the methods and techniques that we use, especially by the imaging team, have greatly have changed greatly. We no longer use glass plate negatives. So next slide, please. So this, this is a, a summary of the imaging techniques that we used on the, on the Messel standing feather fan when it was with us from the Fitzwilliam. Um, I think at, pre at present it's best to state that we use medium format digital cameras made by phase one. Uh, these have 150 megapixel digital backs. These provide incredible photographic detail and the highest level of information possible for our researchers. Uh, this image shows what is usually observed as standard flat copy reproduction imaging. So we have two lights either side of the camera, usually at 45 degrees. Um, and we always start um, answering research questions with really high resolution standard images like this um, before moving on to other imaging methods. So we've also included transmitted light, macro and focus stacking, reflectance transformation imaging and multispectral imaging while the fan was with us. Next, next, next thank you. Um, so this is a, a standard image of the fan at high resolution with our phase one kit. Uh, so two lights either side creates a, uh, a very flat and evenly lit area. Um, the item that you can see to the right of the fan incidentally is one of our calibration, color calibration scales. This ensures 
accurate colour reproduction and exposure, as well as having a useful, a useful measurement scale along its side. We tend to use this in all our images. Next slide, slide please, Stefan. Uh, so that 150 megapixel dig digital back creates impressively high detail images, like I said. So here is a 100% crop of the previous image. Uh, this, can, this simple image can reveal details that can be quite difficult for the viewer to observe with a fan in hand for any length of time. You know, the concentration needed to see these small details is quite difficult. So the digital image is, is um, really beneficial here. So moving on to the next slide, please, Stefan. Um, if the researcher requires greater information and close-up details, the addition of a macro lens and techniques such as focus stacking can create further highly detailed areas of interest that, um, that are in focus and sharp across the entirety of the image. Uh, focus stacking, if you don't know, is where we can take dozens of images as the camera focuses along the item, software then stitches them back together and you have an image which is sharp from the front to the back of the subject matter. So you can see all that information. But what I've done here, I've, I've included actually an image which doesn't do focus stacking. Um, and this is taking advantage of the limitations of the optics of the macro lens. By shooting an area of interest uh, with a larger lens aperture, you can create a very narrow area of focus or depth of field. That's the area of view that has acceptable sharpness. This can be just millimeters in depth, it's tiny. This, but this can highlight very specific areas of interest. And as examples here, you can see the ends of the feathers and the uh, adhesive residue of the fan. I think this, this, this image is amazing, it shows so much. So you don't really need to see uh, front to back detail. There's a pros and cons for all imaging methods. Next slide, please, Stefan. Um, this is quite an unusual. Transmitted light imaging of an object might seem counterproductive to some people. The item is lit from behind, or in this case, from beneath. Um, we use a glass table, which allows us to light from the sides down underneath the object and back up through, through the object and into the camera. We often use this imaging method for watermarks and also for photographing large neg glass negative material. Um, a modern light panel or an LED, LED table will do just the same job. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, it can seem counterproductive to image an item as a silhouette almost, but in some areas where light penetrates the fan, it reveals hidden structures and can inform more on its structure. Stefan will discuss this later. I don't want to give too much away. Next slide, please, Stefan. So moving on, with our different methods. Here's a much more involved imaging technique called reflectance transformation imaging, also known as RTI for short. It has another, other names such as polynomial texture mapping or single camera multiple light imaging. So the item is directly below the camera. It's photographed numerous times as a light source moves around it at varying heights. So imagine a clock face and three circling paths of light at different heights. You can just make out in this slide two spheres each side of the object in this, in this slide. And those are very important in RTI as the software tracks and analyzes the reflected highlights in that sphere when it creates its final RTI file. There are commercially available domes with built-in LED lights, um, but this technique can be achieved very simply with either a torch or a handheld flash. So it's quite achievable for most people to, to recreate. We use a handheld flash and a, and a length of string to maintain distance. Uh, we make three circuits at three different heights, which results in 36 images. Um, the images can then be imported into RTI, an RTI builder and viewer software, both of which are free to download and will provide links at the end of the presentation. Next slide, please, Stefan. And if you could click play on this little video of the software at work. So basically, because we've moved the light around, the software enables you to recreate that lighting feature of the fan. Um, so you can zoom in, you can move the light around and see the structure and the materiality of the feather fan. Um, 
and there are other viewing modes. Um, we can view the normals. This is where light um, hits the object perpendicularly and is recorded. And then we have um, uh, spectral enhancements where you can get rid of the color and enhance the spectral highlights. Other versions are where you can tell the software to show you the item with light from multiple areas at the same time. Um, so it's sort of quite a useful, very useful tool for research of looking at the item and its materiality. Next slide, please, Stefan. So moving on to multispectral imaging, which um, everyone likes to talk about. We've been developing multispectral imaging at the Ryle since about 2012. Um, we've been fortunate to work with the developers of the software and the hardware in furthering its capabilities. Uh, we've worked very closely with our ins other institutions, such as the Library Cong Congress in the US, and very closely with phase one of late, who have developed the system further to make it semi-automated. So in its most basic form, multispectral imaging allows us to see things we wouldn't normally see with the naked eye. So we capture a sequence of images from UV or ultraviolet light, 365 nanometers, through the electromagnetic uh, spectrum through to near infrared, in this case, 940 nanometers. We can then process that data in different ways, depending on the research question. And here you can see the camera system sequencing, this is speeded up, I must say, sequencing through the, the, the light sequence from the LED panels. Next slide, please, Stefan. Um, I think that probably in the heritage sector, the multispectral imaging is used mostly for palimpsest. This is where writing material such as parchment has been cleaned of its original text and reused. This is one of our papyri. This is Greek papyri 465. And you can see here from the left, which is the standard image, as you would see with the naked eye. And you've got the UV image. Uh, this is 370 nanometers. Um, where you can see both texts really clearly. The next image is in infrared, where the under text has almost disappeared, and you can just see the over text. And then through further processing, you can make out where we differentiate between the pixels, you can make out the under text and not show the over text. Um, so this is one of our very first experiments, probably 10 years ago now. Next slide, please, Stefan. So, we did multispectral, quite intense multispectral imaging on the Messel fan. Um, this is one side of one of the main panels. Um, as you can see, there are 22 images in this sequence going through the, from UV through to infrared. This does create a lot of data. It's a lot of information for computers to process. And I think just this one sequence of one side creates four to five gigabytes of data. That's not, then thinking about file naming protocols, metadata schema, preservation standards, all that sort of stuff that we'll have to talk about, but I'm not gonna talk about here because that's a totally different conversation and so I'll quickly move on. Stefan, next slide. So here we have one straight image out of the multispectral camera at one wavelength. This is 600 nanometers, 660 nanometers, I think it's deep red rather than red. And sometimes just a straight image of a multispectral wavelength is enough to answer the researcher's question. Um, yeah, sometimes with UV and infrared wavelengths, that's more in relation to inks and manuscripts and printed material. So to image a feather fan at the Rylands for us was quite a new experience and a new level of research imaging. And Stefan can discuss his research results in a moment. Next slide, please, Stefan. So we've looked at that was a, a simple, multispectral single image, but we do take, you know, at the, at the moment we take 22 to 29 images in that sequence for a multispectral session. Um, if that single image is insufficient in information, we can process this stuff a lot further. We can stake that stack of images and run it through different types of software. We use ImageJ or in our latest multispectral kit by phase one known as Rainbow, um, we have a built-in analysis module, which hopefully will be available to researchers as a separate module in the future. So we can run various algorithms such as principal component analysis, which then can lead to pseudo color images, which can then be color mapped in various ways to aid investigation. So, because we all see 
color and data differently. So if I process something up for Stefan and I think this is really useful, it might not be for Stefan because he will see it totally differently. So that need for a collaboration and a discussion between the imaging lab and the researcher is paramount. It is definitely needed. Um, so I suppose we could say the Messel standing feather fan was submitted to a very robust, intensive, but holistic imaging session while it was at the Rylands. And I think it's a very good time. I'll hand back to Stefan so we can discuss his research further. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you very much, Tony. I mean, one of the key uh, takeaways is really to think of imaging for us as not, it's not about visual representation, but it's very much a method, a method that reveals insights that we would otherwise hardly see and not see at all, in fact, and also that provoke new questions. And before we talk a bit through the results of this analysis, um, I would like to say a bit more about what it actually meant for early modern Europeans to encounter and to experience feathers from Amazonia and feather work from Amazonia in particular, um, because this will contextualize the data that we have um, gathered in the course of this analysis. So Amazonia um, has more species of birds than any other place on earth. And this biodiversity is really crucial to think about because it resulted in unparalleled expertise in, in the processing of feathers. And 16th century Brazil was a hub of some of the most refined feather work in the world, which um, resulted in sophisticated knowledge of birds, avian behaviors, material properties of feathers, unparalleled craftsmanship, and the real significance of birds and feathers in the social, spiritual, and crafts world of indigenous cultures. And it's not surprising in that sense that Europeans, well, or they have to say the other way around, that in this indigenous feather work um, became a constant source of inspiration and curiosity for early modern Europeans who marveled the extreme beauty and marvelous sight. And these were quotes from Brazilian feather work, ropes, headdresses, bracelets, and other ornaments of green, red, blue feathers, and of other various true and natural colors. Uh, key here are the Tupinamba, a Tupi-speaking indigenous community established on the eastern Atlantic coast of today Brazil. And uh, visitors from 16th century Europe in that area write about, for instance, that there is no feather worker in France who could handle these feathers better, nor arrange them more skillfully. Other visitors describe the experience of touching feather work, indigenous feather work, as uh, being comparable to, to, the, to, to the touching of a deep napped velvet um, or of artifacts which are entirely made of silk thread. So it's an experience of light, shimmer, color, softness that um, contextualize the appreciation of such um, artifacts. And soon European prints reported about um, this artisanal knowledge. They reported about what it meant to source birds in Amazonia, how indigenous um, craftspeople were plucking feathers carefully without hurting these birds, how feather skirts, for instance, were made, and how the feather making as a workmanship that, quote, much exceeds the value of the material, as Marta says, um, was appreciated and how it functioned. And it is this context of our creativity and the appreciation of indigenous crafts cultures that really much lends itself into a discussion of feather work and into an appreciation of feathers as treasures, treasures from Amazonian Brazil, treasures from that, that mesmerized Europeans who were completely amazed by the sheer abundance of Amazonian biodiversity. Europeans were writing about feathers arriving in Europe that were, quote, as yellow as fine gold, as red as fine scarlet, more red than any other red color, of sparkling sky blue, blue as clear as can be. So um, they admired these new artifacts and materials. And that's why also Amazonian feathers and birds and feather work became desirable colonial commodities. Um, so the trade in panaches and very exquisite feathers was one of the largest commerce in 16th century Brazil, despite uh, besides the commerce in Brazilwood. Um, there were that also meant that European purchasers became dependent on indigenous supply, and the Tupinamba in particular, they started to trade a lot with uh, toucan bird skins and parrots with European visitors. So 
it is about this story of global consumerism that lent European artisans towards creative responses, but they also disrupted established trading patterns in 16th century Amazonia, shifting the focus from inland source community towards indigenous coastal supply communities, who in return then got, for instance, axes, knives, so artifacts which themselves were used to further exploit these resources like birds, um, and that further increased mobility and dependencies in the region. Um, and the Dutch fully capitalized on this Brazilian colonial commerce and feathers with the foundation of the Dutch West East India Company in 1621. And also the Dutch governors like Johann Mauritz, for instance, in his residence in Mauritzstadt, he established lots of aviaries with, 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 with Brazilian birds. He uh, collected feather work. He was delighted in showing and explaining these rarities himself towards visitors, especially to Pinamba cloaks and uh, colorful feather headbands cloaks, headgear. Um, that meant that these artifacts were traded. They soon entered European cabinets of curiosities, markets in Amsterdam, which established itself as a thriving hub of cross-European commerce and avian species. And they elicited curiosity, um, excitement, They and Brazilian birds and feather work in particular um, was center stage in court performances as well in that time. This is the surrounding in which we have, or the context in which we have to think of the metal fan as gaining cultural meaning in this world. Um, at the same time, we also have to think about Amazonian biodiversity as um, challenging early modern Dutch artisanships established focus on lifelike representation, because this was a world in which the view of art as surpassing nature was very, very crucial. And these Dutch colonial material encounters then caused also new appreciation of the beauty of natural transformation, what natural transformation can mean, what it can do, and uh, yeah, what it what it is, and it is in this context that the metal fans fence iconography really shares the aesthetics with Brazilian natural studies, uh, but also with Maria Sibylla Merian's work on insects in Dutch Suriname, uh, work that was fascinated by the phenotypic plasticity of these organisms, thus organisms' creative transformation responding to environmental impact. Um, and it is in this world that such insects, such feathers, such birds, and feather work in particular got collected and sparked an interest in what it means to translate nature's metamorphosis into the manufacturing of natural materials. Um, and this is exactly what happens with this uh, metal fan. The artisan really departed from established practices in fan making. Usually you would encounter in Europe these full fluffy panars made of ostrich feathers. Um, but here we see an artisan who tries to explore the effective possibilities of feather fan making by going into the, the, the yeah, exploring the sensorial depth of a flat, particularly flat, feather fan, which in itself is grounded in this Dutch tradition of feather working entrepreneurship. So um, the and Dutch and Flemish tradition of entrepreneurship and feather working, the guilds of feather workers in Brussels and Antwerp, the so called Plumaciers, um, um, founded in 1530 and 1579 were among the very first feather working guilds in Europe. So this feather fan, I would say, is a response, a creative response to um, panache making as it was known in Europe, fueled through an appreciation of indigenous crafts and crafts products arriving in Europe and the feathers that were there too. And imaging really helps us to understand this artifact as materializing crafts innovation. So it reveals how the fascination for Amazonian biocreativity could spark a feather worker's ambitions to test the limits of established artisanal practices, to translate the ingenuity of environmental materiality, if we want to put it that way, into crafts cultures itself. On the one hand, imaging data facilitates the identification of birds. Um, so early modern ornithological specimens are rare survivals just as a background information. If so, we they're often comprising color alterations as resulting from changing nourishments, habitats, light exposure, storage, 
conditions. We also have to think about changing historical migration patterns, for instance. And um, feathers pigmentation, however, has a very distinct response patterns to specific wavelengths. And that was crucial information for us to distinguish different kinds of feathers and birds which were used um, <clears throat> because imaging and multispectral imaging in particular really provided more information about um, and also macrophotography uh, more information about the surface structure iridescence patterns color specificities pigmentation schemes and spectral sensitivities that then could be combined with the an analysis of ornithological specimens and the archivals information about for instance feather workers inventories um, we see that the feather worker predominantly used South American species. He prioritized them. We see here the cobalt blue feathers of the Cotinga Cotinga that shaped the feather fence overall aesthetics. The red and white feathers that we see here were used from the Pompadour Cotinga. Um, the green feathers um, belong to the Amazon parrot. The yellow and red feathers were taken from widely traded um, channel built toucans and such birds were really endemic to the Americas and above all to early modern Dutch colonies in Brazil and the Guyanas. The mesal fence frame, however, um, is composed of feathers of the little egret, which is a species common in European wetlands and which has been widely used by European, early modern European feather workers. So this is one information that we gain. However, by seeing this different, um, yeah, the different spectral responses of feathers, we also come to realize that the artisan consciously chose to relate the crafting of this artifact towards effectivity in that sense that the fan responds to the entire visible spectrum. So this means the fan really attracts the eye on different agendas on different registers. And that is likewise cool, key since it shows knowledge, knowledge of the artisan. Um, the artisan also was key to showcase his own knowledge about the bird's habitats, the avian habitats, which, which are crucial for these animals. Um, but this is also a comment on the making of this fan itself, because you see the beak of the birds of these two Cotingas in particular, pointing towards the chest, the chest of the bird. Um, and for making the making of these particular parts of the fan, the artisan predominantly used the chest feathers of these um, birds because they were softer. And this is um, very crucial as well. And the bird is shown using its beak to cleanse the feathers. And that was a process that also was done by the feather worker when using hands, brushes, or other tools to cleanse in each feather prior to processing it. Um, that is also a key observation. And then um, we got more information about the five sections of drawn thread work that is um, the basis for this entire feather work, for this entire feather fan. So these threads had previously been assumed to be made of gut. However, transmitted light imaging shows the intricacy with which the artisan actually twisted and bent plant fibers into double threads, which were then interwoven into different regular schemes according to the shape of the feather work that was later on then added. And Imagining and implementing this threadwork design is itself a remarkable achievement involving present imagination, complex calculations, and master, masterful manual skills. So here we see also an artisan's response towards um, basketry work, towards rattle work, which was considered by Europeans as manifesting in the ingenious mind of artisans. Um, then the artisan glued and stitched finely cut felt templates onto both sides of the panels and transmitted light imaging really shows their use and reveals the pinholes that are now covered by, um, by, by, the, feather, by, by the feathers. The templates were then forming bases on which feathers were glued in a layering technique. Um, they were that means the feather artist had first to um, had first to sort the feathers for colors and shapes. Then the feathers were cleansed were cleansed with, from preen oil using soap, hot water. Finally, they were cut into distinct shapes. And imaging really reveals the precision of these acts, the concentration and the skill that went into such a making process. Um, and he really excelled in doing that. So here we see an example where the artisan uh, cut 
individual barbs of feathers into the representation of the se insect's antennae. And this is really precision on millimeter scale that was applied. And damaging these feathers barbules would have resulted in the loss of their distinct dark green iridescence, which was key to the effective resonances that this artifact could evoke. And he really mastered this brilliantly, as we can see here. So this artisan um, was really skilled and uh, innovative in processing these materials. Then several layers of feathers were glued onto templates and photomicrographs of insect damage really reveal that at least six layers of feathers were glued onto each other, even though the result is extremely thin. Um, and this was done in ways that highlight symmetry of, of the, the, the symmetry of the overall um, fan. So that means we need to think well, for, for, for each of these details, the artisan had to, had to have in mind the entire, the entire appearance of this artifact. And manual dexterity, that's another key story here. Um, it was really vital that we use these methods also to get more information about the binding materials which were used. And we came to realize that, this, that these binding materials had distinct colors, distinct surface structures, and distinct responses, spectral responses to multispectral imaging that reveals patterns of such responses and therefore the systematic use of adhesives and of different kinds of adhesives depending on specific materials and manual activities. So we could identify three different kinds of adhesives being used, a golden brown adhesive to fix the felts onto the fibers, then a different glue of black grayish color um, that um, was used only to work with the feathers. And it is a very, very special glue because, um, because it is had, it has a very spectral sensitivity and, and a very specific spectral sensitivity and fluorescence that is different towards what we think of as other kinds of glues that would be usually used. But spectral imaging also reveals the use of these glues. So here, for instance, I hope you see the mouse that I'm waving over the uh, screen. Here you see the application of these glues that you would otherwise not see with your mirror eyes. But you also get to see lost details, lost feather work, um, feather work which is lost today, um, only because we see the traces of the glue which is still there. Um, and then a third glue which was used is this one here. It is um, distinct in terms of its viscous qualities and it, it is quite similar in appearance towards feather glue, glues used for feather work by indigenous cultures at that time, especially from these two plants. And we know from the sources that indigenes also traded such as adhesives to Europeans. And we see really the manual dexterity. So this artisan um, really, yeah, I want to say enjoyed, clearly delighted in exploiting the molding characters and characteristics of applying such innovative clues to arrange, for instance, uh, yeah, when twirling or twisting, for instance, these violet American feathers into the shape of European thistles. And mastering such complex uh, such craft at such complexity really meant to work with the material affordances and not against the materials that he was working with. And that meant that this artisan had to align to new world materials and the demands that they impose on the making of these um, of this craft. And that's the final example we want to highlight as well. Um, microscopy has shown that there are distinct yeah, that there are blurring color variations on the spines of uh, the pale pink feathers that were used for the fence frame. And they are indicative for dyeing processes that were widespread among early modern feather workers. However, this was secretive knowledge. So I have some of these recipes for other contexts. However, unfortunately, not for the Dutch context. And here, multispectral imaging was really crucial to make us think a bit more about the pigments that could have been used and to help to recover such, um, such information. If compared to the distinct spectral image curves of pigments, the methyl fence 10 identified pale pink sample areas match with the spectral curve response of caput mortum, thus burn vitriol. And the fence pink 
the frame thus must have originally had a rather brownish violet appearance that faded into pink due to light exposure um, due to storage conditions, for instance. And that means that we must think of this frame as matching the brown color of the handle, as matching the lilac color of the Kutinga. And um, this also speaks towards the general culture in which um, caput mortum was produced in the 17th century. This is an iron oxide pigment that was won um, as a residue of alchemical experiments at that time. So the dye stuff's application had also strong alchemical connotations um, because the use of this material meant mastering the deeper secrets of natural transformation shared among alchemists, art artists, and as it turns out, also the feather workers. Um, and brownish cult color also is key here because um, Europeans were particularly puzzled by the brownish colors of New World feathers. So Peter Marta, a contemporary observer, uh, is amazed by these brilliant feathers and even that are even of browns, as he put it, which gives indigenous feather work a very special elegance. So here we see the methyl fan as a kind of response, uh, a comment on these effective uh, registers. Dying European white aigrette feathers with caput mortem would, would have been a statement of artisanal ingenuity in the transformation of European materials in ways that matched and actually exceeded Amer American biocreativity and multispectral imaging was really key to reveal that. So to wrap up things in a minute or two, um, three, four key insights are are crucial for what we wanted to say. So first of all, it's very important for us to, to reject any essentialization of featherwork um, and to think of featherwork rather as dynamic and creative sites of encounters which can be revealed through such a methodology. And revealing and uncovering such shared colonial histories, I would say, is also cru crucial for arguing for shared responsibilities in the conservation of such cultural heritage and imaging here can be key as well. We propose a combined methodology that shifts perspectives, perspectives from meaning towards perspectives on making, uh, which allows for much richer understanding of the translation of material knowledge. So here we have a story of cross-cultural use of Amazonian birds, uh, global dye stuffs, innovative adhesives, and intricate manufacturing techniques that were translating biocreativity into craft cultures. And it made us think a bit more about the interplay between materiality, affectivity, and cognition. So when I was speaking with Julian Vermeulen, a contemporary praised uh, feather artist, he said the only imagination, uh, the only limits of feather working is one's own imagination. And that's what allows us imaging, imaging allows us to put this into context. And then, of course, there is the story about biocreativity and yeah, the Im immeasurable global creative potential of South American biodiversity and cultural diversity, which makes us add insights into the consequences of its growing extinction today. And um, now I will hand over to Tony for showing us one final bits of the analysis. And um, I would just add as an information that if you want to read more about this, all of this will be also, also soon published in an article in Current Anthropology, which is currently in press. Thank you, Stefan. Shall um, I stop sc please. screen sharing? Here it is. Okay, let me just share my screen um, if we have time for this. Um, so we didn't have time to do any 3D imaging of the Messel fan. So what I've done is taken the normals image, if you remember in our RTI uh, file, which is shown as a color map of light hitting the item at uh, perpendicular angles. Um, and I've put it into the software called Sketchfab, which allows us to deliver 3D information. So I've taken two JPEGs of the fan itself and two JPEGs of the normals from the RTI file, which enables me to recreate the fan and how it reacts to light. And I've also created a depth of field effect. So you're almost mimicking the 3D effect of a fan from four 2D images, which I think works quite well for recreating how light shimmers and reflect on the fan. Would you say that was correct, Stefan? 
Absolutely perfect. And it's really crucial for us also to have this handling experience because this is a highly fragile artifact. Yeah. Um, and I think here imaging really also provides a new handling experience, a new experience of encounter and of exploring the effective depth of such artifacts making them available but this is all what we have to say i just want to thank uh, tony and the entire team really for the amazing work and the amazing experience of being part of this collaboration and as i said more will be published soon thank you both for that fantastic presentation i'd like to give you a kind of virtual round of applause i hope all of the audience are clapping as well um if anybody has a burning question, uh, you could put it in the yes, we have we have one burning question. So I shall I shall just go straight to that. We have probably three minutes. Um, have you analysed the DNA of feathers? To either of you? No, we haven't for a simple reason, because DNA analysis would be um, would have result in a damage of this artifact. Um, for this, you have to source uh, the materials. You have to cut out parts of the of the of the fans um, feathers, and this is a unique artifact, uh, unique cultural heritage. So we have not done that, and that's why we decided for this holistic imaging approach, because this is a non-invasive uh, method that makes things visible, which we would otherwise not see. Thank you. Um, I had one question, which you can have 20 seconds each on. Um, what's next? What's next for your feather work, for your imaging work in relation to this object or anything else? Stefan, do you want to elaborate? Um, so one idea would be that we, we try to further push this uh, and push and test this method with other indigenous feather work from across the world. Um, and that is what we try to do in for the next months. Tony, anything to add? Yeah, I think the comparison with other uh, fan feathers and other other material would be uh, really interesting. I'd be quite keen to to work with Stefan on that. Yeah, brilliant. We can ask you back next year to to report on it, which would be fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, we've got two more questions. Um, oh. I'll take them really quickly. Has your research presented any insight into the contemporary ethics of using animal products in this way? Um, well, I think the importance here is to allow um, for animal, pro pro uh, animal products to be situated in broader life worlds and to allow us to consider different um, embeddedness, if we want to put it that way, of such artifacts into life. Um, so these um, artifacts were key for the effective emotional world across the colonial divide, but they also had broader spiritual meanings, they had broader social meanings, they were embedded into hierarchies of knowledge, which were uh, which into secretive knowledge. Um, so it is important to take this into account and to reflect on the use of such, uh, such methods um, in that regard, and also to share such knowledge with indigenous communities today, because um, much of this knowledge has been lost also as a consequence of such artifacts making, because um, the European or almost global feather craze in the early modern period also resulted in increased exploitation of natural resources sources, which then in turn also means that social knowledge, emotional knowledge, the, 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 the bio-creativity gets lost over time, over the centuries. And in fact, much of the information that we would that we recover through such imaging techniques is lost information, lost crafts information that I think as a next step is also important to share with indigenous communities in order to um, yeah, to, to make such knowledge available again, which is to recover it. Okay, thank you. Um, I think I'm going to have to stop it there because we, we do really need to draw it to a close. Um, if either one of you would like to do a text answer in the chat, the last question was, would it be possible to reconstruct the original appearance of the fan, given that it's aged and has been subject to degradation? So perhaps we could think about that. Uh, we can put it in the YouTube comments as, a, as an answer if we can't answer it very quickly. Um, for now, I'd just like to thank um, Tony and Stefan again. I'd like to um, also thank the team, the backroom team in the Rylands, uh, who've kept this running so smoothly, and to thank all of you for your questions, and, and, and also to apologise to those whose questions I couldn't answer. 
Um, I couldn't ask an answer because of the constraints on time. Um, next week's se seminar will be broadcast from the map room in the library again. Um, it'll be at the same time and on the same link, and it will feature Brian Wallace and Donna Sherman, who will be talking to us about maps and magic in the Manchester Geographical Society collections. So you can find more details. That's my fire alarm. Uh, I hope it's just the practice. Um, you can find more details and register in the Eventbrite link. Um, and we'll put that in the chat as well, I think, for people. Um, and uh, Stefan, as I said, thanks as well to Fitzwilliam, of course. Um, I hope they're watching. Um, and uh, so thank you all again for coming and I'll see you all next week.